general vegetable gardening uh, topics. Uh, seems like that uh, interest in, in growing your own vegetables has, has been on the increase, and it seems like it's just exploded this year with the, the onset of the COVID-19 folks kind of being quarantined at home and not really excited about going to the grocery store. And sometimes when they go to the grocery stores, it's hard to find things that they want. So that has made, that has made uh, vegetable gardening seem like it's, it's become more of an interest. And it's a hobby. It's a kind of a fun thing to do. And uh, it's, uh, it's just something that, to me, I, I've been doing it a long time. It releases a lot of stress for me. So this isn't a very long presentation. It's kind of a condensed version that I usually do when I'm giving a master gardener talk. Uh, so it, during this, if anybody's got questions, just uh, you can you can ask her. Type it in the chat box, and we'll answer the things as we go along. But uh, we'll, we'll kind of start. I think there's only 20 slides. But the, of course, the first thing that that the folks need to kind of understand is is when you're when you're thinking about doing a, a garden, a vegetable garden in, in specific. What we're talking about today or really anything that you want to do good is, is paying attention to detail before you ever start. And with, with planting a vegetable garden and maintaining one and actually getting to the point where you're harvesting, it's a, it's a process that kind of be, you kind of look at planting and doing things kind of year round. Uh, but paying attention to detail means if you've never had a garden, you've got to select a spot. And of course, you've got to select a spot that's as good of soils as you possibly can find. Plenty of sunlight. Most of our vegetables need need at least eight hours of sunlight a day. Of course, a, a site that's not real steep, maybe it's not too low that holds water. Sometimes that's a challenge for folks. Uh, a session a couple weeks ago on raised bed gardens, which is a pretty neat way to, to raise vegetables. Uh, if you don't have an area that, that kind of fix all the boxes of what you need uh, for vegetables. Um, so this person that we seeing the, the slide has, has, has done a lot of that paying attention to detail. You can tell that, that they have uh, got a good spot. They work the soil when the soil is in the correct condition to work the soil, which has been a challenge this year, getting soil dry enough. Uh, they've selected good seed, good Bible seed. They've uh, planted that seed at the correct depth. Uh, They've got uh, the disease, insects, and weeds under control, so they they paid attention to detail in managing pests. Uh, they set themselves up uh, in, in the short term for having a really, really productive garden here. So kind of an intro to uh, doing a vegetable garden is, is doing your homework and paying attention to detail before you ever plant the first seed or set the first transplant out in the garden. So, one of the keys before before you start, and, and there's a, seems like there's a lot of confusion on when do I plant certain vegetables, especially for new newcomers to the vegetable gardening world, is that uh, some vegetables you know prefer to grow when it's kind of cool, when the when the sun is shorter in the sky and the daytime shorter, and some prefer to be planted when it's when it's in the summer. So we kind of classify them based on their growth habits. And the first group that we'll talk a little bit about is those that we consider are cool season crops. And some generalities about, about these cool season crops is that uh, they, they can be planted in the early, sp or early spring, even late winter in some cases. And most of them can be planted again in the fall. So you can actually get two crops from, from these. Um, when, when that list that we're looking at there, those are, that are both very cold hardy, your, your cabbages, a lot of the greens like mustard, kale, collards, and spinach, lettuce, I mean some, some of the root crops like radishes and, and, uh, and your carrots, onions, they, they can actually be planted uh, if you count back from when we experienced our last frost, uh, which in southern middle Tennessee, here in Lawrence County in particular, uh, we, we think about April the about the April 15th to April 20th time frame, we still have a 50% chance of getting a frost. And this year, we actually had a frost 
this past week, and we were on into the first week of May, and typically, you know, we're down to about only a 10% chance of getting a frost, but this was one of those one in 10 years. But as, as we look at these cool season crops, you know, they thrive in that weather. Those very cold hardy group right there, you can actually get those planted about four to six weeks back from that last frost date, average frost date. If we ponder that as being the middle of April, then a lot of those we can actually get in the garden in, in the spring and first part of March. Uh, the group that's classified the moderately cold hardy, your, your beets, broccoli, cauliflowers, Irish potatoes, uh, Swiss chard, those will will not tolerate a freeze as much as a very cold hardy group so you want to wait a little bit later about getting those in the ground probably about two to four weeks from that last frost date so those we're looking at late march even early april but uh, they will tolerate still a, a frost not so much a freeze uh, and in most of these we can turn right back around and we can plant those again in the fall so many times uh looking at depending on the weather, late August and in, in the whole month of September, most of these things can be planted again. And some of them are even better done in the fall. One is particular that I talk a little bit more about in the Master Gardener program is carrots. Carrots are much better planted in the fall than they are in the spring because they, they tend to do better when the daytime is getting shorter, not longer. So, But in general, you can do most of these both times. Uh, some other generalities about cool season crops is they're a little easier to raise. There's not as much insect disease and weed issues in, in, in April and May and September and October, November as there is in July, August uh, time frame. They, in general, are kind of more shallow rooted. So they, they do well in a raised bed garden as opposed to some of our warm season crops uh, in general. Uh, they need a lot of nitrogen and most of these we're trying to grow a lot of leaves and, and uh, so they need a little bit more nitrogen than some of our warm season crops so uh, and then another generality about these is when we consider them as terms of their their value and being healthy for us and their nutrient content especially in minerals uh these cold these cool season crops tend to outperform the warm season crops in terms of being more healthy for us so depending on how we I would compare them, but uh, uh, the, then we, we kind of go into our worm season group, and this is, these are the vegetables that most of us are more familiar with. Uh, these particularly need to be planted after that last frost has gone by, which if you had a lot of tomatoes out uh, before this last frost, and you, were, you didn't cover them, you probably lost them, uh, because they don't, they, they don't like frost at all. Um, so in general, these you need to wait till the very end of, of April, even into the first part of May, before we don't put these these vegetables in the ground. Uh, your beans, that be your pole beans, your bush beans, all your cucurbits like your cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, watermelons, cantaloupes, uh, okras, peppers, tomatoes. They are all your warm season crops, and some generalities about your warm season crops as opposed to the cool season crops is here we're probably trying to grow the fruit more so than, than we are the leaves. So one caution on a lot of these is we tend to sometimes over apply nitrogen where we want to on cool season crops. But for some of these, if we put too much nitrogen on before that plant actually sets a fruit, we can actually hurt ourselves and delay fruiting. Uh, example would be tomatoes. We had calls usually always every year. I'll get a call. Somebody will, will say they've got this absolutely beautiful tomato plant or plants that's uh, pretty and green and it's already gotten six feet tall and it has yet to make uh, a fruit. And probably what's happened there is that particular person is probably put too much nitrogen on that tomato plant and it's caused it to grow, 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 and it's actually the late, the late fruit set. So some of these vegetables, okra is one, tomatoes is another one, and peppers, you need to actually wait till you get a little fruit set before you apply much nitrogen. But your, your other two nutrients, your phosphorus and your potash, are very important in producing these fruits, so those certainly need to be put on at plant. Um, 
Another kind of general characteristic about these is they're more deep rooted, so they're able to tolerate that hot dog days of August and July. So they they're, they're deeper rooted to to allow them to reach down there a little further and grab that uh, grab that moisture. They're also a little bit more difficult to raise without uh, without some type of spray because when we get into late June, July, and August. That's when our diseases and our insects are going are going wild. So some of these are a little bit more difficult to grow than full season crops organically. But, uh, uh, so that's kind of how we, we classify our, our vegetables is by their growing season, and, uh, full season, warm season. And this is a time of year that we're thinking more about getting our warm season crops in the ground. So another another thing to kind of consider is uh, how big does your garden need to be to give you enough enough produce to, to feed your family. So research has kind of shown that uh, a small garden is all you need. Uh, basically, a, a thousand foot square foot garden, twenty five by forty ish, forty two ish, is usually large enough to provide all the produce you need for a family of two for for the entire year. I personally, and I know a lot of other folks tend to err on the side of making making the garden too big, which vegetable garden is a very laborious hobby. It takes a lot of work to do it. So the bigger your garden, the more work you're gonna have to do. And of course, we all like to give produce to our friends and neighbors, but sometimes we can actually have too big of a garden and have more than we can actually feed our whole, our whole neighborhood. So just keep in mind that, uh, you know, don't, don't, plant too much, but certainly plant enough to, to allow you to be able to grow what you need. Now, in terms of a raised bed garden, those can be more intensively managed and you can actually raise a lot more produce on a raised bed garden than you can uh, just a normal traditional garden. So that there's are some advantages for those raised bed gardens about raising more more produce and high quality produce. So in addition to that, you know, some vegetables didn't require as much space, and you can get away with, uh, with putting a lot more things in smaller areas, whereas some other things require a whole lot of space. So understanding that's pretty important in terms of uh, raising your garden as well. So if you don't have a lot of space, you want to try to avoid your, your winter squashes and your pumpkins and, and your watermelons and muskmelons. And those are kind of, we classify those as cucurbits. They're vine crops. They, they take a whole lot of space in order to produce you know, a few fruits. So if you don't have a lot of space, then you probably want to stay away from those. Some of the crops that uh, are more kind of bush type growth habits that don't require as much space, and some of these you have to have support to help them grow in that form, would be your summer squashes, your peppers, tomatoes, and cucumbers. Now cucumbers, if you just let them grow flat on the ground, you would have to put them up in the above category because they are going to require a lot of space. So cucumbers, because the fruit is not as large as, as a pumpkin or a watermelon, you can actually train those cucumbers to grow up a support, whether it be, uh, I like to grow them on uh, cattle panels and train them when they first start growing and they'll grab a hoe and they'll grow up those really nice. It makes picking easier. It conserves space a lot more because they're growing vertical instead of horizontal. And uh, it's a lot easier, easier to pick them that way. So how you grow your vegetables sometimes can, can affect uh, how much you can grow in space needs as well. One thing, most of the cool season crops don't require a lot of space at all. So in general, those doesn't take a lot of space at all. So um, another thing to think about sweet corn, you know, it only, uh, when you plant your sweet corn, you pretty much get one harvest. It might last about a week, 10 days, you know, when that corn is in the right stage to, to pick it. But once you get it picked, then it's done. So you don't get multiple harvests from it. So that's something also to consider when you're planting your vegetable garden, what you're going to plant. One of the common uh, points that some people like to, to focus on is trying to grow as close to organic produce as they possibly can, which is a challenge, but not impossible. But if there's 
there's certain vegetables that are much easier to grow without having to spray and there's some that's more challenging so if, if you're trying to do it without a spray schedule or without being able to spray if need be you want to avoid things like broccoli crop and cabbage or two cool season crops that and i've already heard that the cabbage looper moths are already flying around looking for your broccoli looking for your cabbage when they lay those eggs those little worms hatch out and they're hungry and they're, they're hard to find and they can actually devastate those two crops uh, and all your toe crops kind of the picture in the background shows there so they're a little more challenging to raise without without spray all but you've heard it squash and pumpkins they have so many disease and insect issues that are potential on those makes it more difficult tomatoes uh, they have a lot of potential problems those are more challenging some of the crops are easier to raise without spray is your okras and a lot of your actual root crops, your onions, your garlics, your sweet potatoes, carrots, very few, very few pests bother them, whether it be insects or diseases. So if you're trying to do a garden as organically as you possibly can, you need to kind of think about some vegetables a lot easier to do that way than, than others. So one little key to, to help uh, try to to cut down on the amount of disease you might have in a specific uh, variety of vegetables is, is to select a, a variety that has some built-in disease resistance to it. Now, we, we know that when we grow the same crop on the same spot year after year after year, we're setting ourselves up for more, more disease issues because lots of diseases are so born and when we and we're not able to uh, to move them or rotate our spot, then we're setting ourselves up for disease. And if we know we've had disease from year to year, then we might be to our best interest to pick a variety that might have some resistance. Now, this is a, an example. This is a variety of tomatoes called Maxi Fort, and it has some disease resistance built into it by its breeding and it's got some some fusarium wilt uh, and, and five different leaf mold resistance as well as nematode and tobacco mosaic virus and a little bit of reticulum wilt that uh, when you plant this that particular variety will be less apt to have those issues than one that uh, you planted that like an like an open pollinated variety that would not have those kind of resistance so that's a that's something to think about if you've had specific problems from year after year to look at maybe a, trying to pick a variety that has some disease resistance. There's there's a lot of diseases that get on cucurbits. I try to always pick some, some varieties of cucumbers and squash every year that has some disease resistance because they're, they're so apt to get various diseases. So those are a couple of other vegetables that so you need to think about to maybe looking at a a disease resistance package. Now, one thing I, I will point out with this particular slide is this Maxi Fort is a hybrid. When you see this F1 out beside Maxi Fort in parentheses, that tells you something very important. That tells you that this particular variety it is a hybrid, which means it has been bred from two different parents, which in many cases, that, that's good in terms of disease resistance or maybe yield or taste. But if you're going to be saving seeds, you want to avoid saving seeds from a, a hybrid because if you plant the seed from this particular maxi fort, the following year, you're probably not going to get a true representation of what you actually had that current year. So it's not recommended to save seeds from a hybrid. If it's an open pollinated variety, then that's certainly okay. But, uh, so it's, it's important to know if you're planting a hybrid or an open pollinated variety. So when we get to the point where we're ready to plant, and that's my goal this weekend, um, is to plant my garden, is many of our crops are planted directly in the garden by seeds. On the other hand, some things are put in the garden as transplants. But when we're thinking about seeds, it's very important that we start with high quality seeds. So 
And when we're purchasing our seeds, we want to make sure that those seeds were packaged that that same year that we're going to plant them because they're they're a lot more viable. They're guaranteed in many cases, if you read on that seed packet, probably you're guaranteed 90% germ, which that means nine out of every 10 of those seeds are supposed to come up. So it's important that we start with a good seed. Now seeds can be can be stored, they can be saved, but you need to have a strategy to do that. Uh, and they need to be stored in a cool, dry place. And one of the most common places that folks will store their seeds is in a refrigerator in a, in a container that keeps it really, really tight and dry without light. Uh, and some seeds can be, can be saved multiple years. Uh, some seeds won't last hardly as long. Corn seed, you're good. Maybe you get two years out of corn seed, uh, maybe a few carrot seed like a pumpkin. I've planted pumpkin seeds that were four and five years old and still got fairly good germ off of them. So uh, keep in mind that you won't always start with good, high quality seed. The other way we, we put vegetables in our garden is by transplants. Now, you can get transplants one of two ways. You can buy them at the garden center or you can raise them yourself. Now the reason that we put transplants in the garden is because that saves us a little bit of time. You know, tomatoes, if we set a, a tomato seed in the ground today, then that tomato takes so long from the time that seed germinates till it matures and actually produces a, a edible fruit you know, we're already into close to our first frost date in the fall. So we have to kind of cheat mother nature a little bit. And we, uh, we put that out in our garden directly as a transplant. Now, some of the commonly transplanted vegetables that we have are your broccolis, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and cauliflower. Those are all cool season crops and let and head lettuce. Um, for our worm season crops, we need to think about transplant using, using transplants for eggplants, our sweet peppers, our hot peppers, and our, and our tomatoes. And whether we're buying those or raising them themselves. Now, some of the ones that are occasionally transplanted would be some of our cucurbits. You'll always see at the garden centers, cucumbers, cantaloupes, watermelons, okra sometimes that they have available to sell you as transplants. But my personal uh, my personal experience with these is you might buy yourself a little bit of time. They're more expensive to buy than they are by seeds. But most of these, my personal preference is to set, set, set them out directly as seeds in the garden and save a little bit of money. But you can do either or uh, for those. So it's important to know if you're gonna, your crop needs to be bought as a transplant or seed. So just a couple of points on transplants is um, if whether we're raising them on our own or we're buying them, we want to make sure we start with a good, high quality, healthy transplant. Now this picture is from some tomatoes that are actually in peat pots. Uh, it's a very they, this is a very good example of a high quality transplant. The, the plants are short, they're stocky, the stem is very, very big. The leaves are deep green. You don't see any signs of spotting. Um, the one thing you want, might want to do if you're in a garden center and it's not in a peat pot, like it's in a, a plastic pot, you might want to sneak one of those just up a little bit out of the pot to make sure it's not root bound, uh, not been in that pot too long. But the point of this is, is, is whether you're raising your own or you're buying your transplants to start with a good, healthy transplant. Now there's, there's pros and cons to raising your own versus buying. Of course, it takes more time to raise your own, but the pro with raising your own is you basically can select any variety that you can find in a garden catalog from all over the country. If you're going to be buying your transplants, and I found this to be the case this week, you know, you're limited on what you can find. So there's been such a demand for, for garden transplants and seeds. I've been having a hard time finding sweet potato slips, and many tomato, tomato plants are getting to be hard to find around here. So... That, that's a challenge when you're buying your, buying your transplants from a garden center. But regardless of whether you're raising your own or you're buying them from a garden center, just make sure that that thing is healthy before you ever take it home and put it in, put it in the garden. 
Okay, normally in my master gardener program, I'll start with asparagus and we'll go all the way to watermelons and we'll talk about lots of different vegetables. But since we're kind of on a, a time crunch here, I'm going to go through what I like as my top five vegetables and give you some general characteristics about them. And a lot of the things we say about these kind of go along with some of their some of their uh, same family type of crops. So the, the first one I'll start off with is a cool season crop. And it's broccoli. Now, when I was growing up, you know, we raised the garden uh, because we lived 12 miles from town. And we very rarely went to the store, and we did more out of necessity than out of maybe a hobby type deal. And we didn't raise broccoli. I really didn't get introduced to broccoli until I got into college. But when I found it at a uh, eating out at an all you could eat bar one time, I discovered what it was, and I really liked it. And since then, it's become one of my favorite vegetables, and it's really, really easy to raise uh, in our gardens around here. And some of the some of the things to think about is you have to raise it as a transplant, so you either have to start your own seeds, you know, about three or four weeks, two, two, four weeks before you want to plant in the garden, or you buy your transplants, remembering that it's it's a cool season crop, so you can plant it in the spring or the fall. Um, the it's, it's a great source of vitamins A and C. It's a very, very healthy, very, very healthy uh, vegetable. The the varieties, if you're looking for an early maturing variety, this green comet right here in Pat Man are, are a couple of good uh, varieties that, that you might you might consider. What, uh, if you see on a variety this AAS, that means that's an All-American Selection winner, which is uh, a group of, of plant breeders and, and scientists and garden people all across the country that, uh, that look at different varieties every year. And some they deem as All-American Selection winners, which is a good designation. Doesn't mean it's gonna grow good in, in Orange County, Tennessee, but uh, that, that's something that if you ever see what that, that, that designation, that's kind of what that means. So, uh, uh, in, in, entire is a good main crop. Most of these varieties we have now for broccolis are, are the domed heads, like you see with that ink pen in the background, kind of how large that head is. Now, I'll tell you a little secret to broccoli. Once you cut that head off, and you don't want to do that before the edges of that head starts or making little yellow flowers. That, what you're seeing there is just a compact uh group of, of small yellow flowers I and mean, you want to harvest it before the ends the edges start flowering out if you, you see that you waited a little bit too long but the point i wanted to make is once you cut that head don't give up on that broccoli plant because you know, after that head's cut it will still make little shoots of little small heads all around that plant I and mean, you have to go out and make several cuts but usually until the end of middle of june sometimes late june when it gets really hot, broccoli doesn't like it, but typically I'll harvest broccoli on the end of June after I've harvested that first head, just keep going out there and making lots of small cuts. And uh, broccoli's a real easy crop if you keep the cabbage loopers off of them. You've got to watch that. Cabbage loopers can be an issue. Uh, now there's one treatment for those that it's, it, it can be considered organic, and that's uh, dipel. Dipel is a is a bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, it's a naturally occurring bacteria, and you can treat your broccoli with that. And when those worms take a little bite after it's been treated with dipel, they'll actually they'll actually die. So that that's one way to control those cabbage leaves. Uh, second on my list is Irish potatoes. Um, Irish potatoes are are a cool season crop. Now, if you remember, they're uh, moderately cold hardy. So uh, you want to wait till usually around the 1st of April before you put those in the ground. They do very well again in the fall. Uh, Irish potatoes are very unique in how they are planted in the garden because with these, you actually have to purchase uh, actual seed potatoes that have not been treated like the ones you buy in the grocery store to prevent them from sprouting. And once you buy that potato, you'll actually cut it and portions of about one and a half ounces. And all those have to have what we call an eye on them. And it's it's recommended to do that a few hours, if not a day before you intend to plant, because where you cut those those potato, I mean, potatoes, uh, 
slices, uh, that actually needs to kind of heal up what we call super rise. And if you cut them and immediately put them in the ground, they're more out to rot. Whereas if you cut them a few hours or a day before, they super rise, firm up, and they're a lot less out to rot. But once we cut them up, then you will put them about two to three inches deep, separate them about a, a foot apart, and, and potatoes are very, very easy to grow. Now, one of the secrets about Irish potatoes is once you get them planted, I planted mine around the end of April. They're already getting up between knee high or an ankle high. They will soon be flowering. When you see a flower on your Irish potato plant, that tells you that beneath the, the, the soil surface, they're starting to make these little round potatoes about golf ball size. And you can actually reach down and, and uh, scratch around and steal enough new potatoes to, to have you a mess. And that is the very tenderest, most most uh, easy to cook uh, potatoes. And if you go to the grocery store and try to purchase some new potatoes, you're going to pay a fortune for them. So you can do that without disturbing the potatoes below and uh, keep, keep those growing until, until, they, until they mature. And you'll know that maturing and ready to dig, if you want to keep them uh, through, the, through the rest of the summer and even into the fall, you'll want to wait till that plant dies down and before you dig the potatoes if you want them to keep it. Uh, Irish potatoes, that's a cool crop, easy crop to grow, uh, cool season. That's my number two crop. Well, sweet corn. Well, sweet corn. Uh, is, is one of the most common one season crops that that uh, vegetable, vegetable producers grow around here. Uh, you can you can get spot sweet corn, yellow sweet corn, the bicolored sweet corn. Corn, sweet corn in particular, as opposed to field corn that many of our producers plant sometimes in late March. This this was not one of those years I actually got any planted in March because of the weather. But that's really too early for sweet corn varieties because they like soil temperatures above 55 degrees. So you want to wait till your soil temperature gets above 55 degrees, which is really usually almost always late April after that last frost. Typically it's gone. Um, sweet corn is a kind of unique in comparison to other vegetables because it's wind pollinated. So you want to plant corn, split corn in blocks, not one row, so that it gets added, added, adequately uh, pollinated by the wind. So keep that in mind when planting corn, put it in blocks. Uh, some of the varieties uh, that, that uh, you can get split corn in, and first of all, let's talk about the types. Uh, Sweet corn comes in a lot of different, a lot of different uh, types. Uh, the, some of the ones that's been around a long time are these SU types, the sugary types. Probably the most common sweet corn that's, that's been around for, for now going on 30 years is silver queen. The silver queen is simply an SU variety. And it, it's a sweet corn, but it, it loses its sweetness pretty fast once you harvest it. Then we get into SE types. Those are their sugary enhanced types, and they have been bred to hold their sugars a little bit longer and be a little sweeter than the SU types. And uh, Honey Select is a good yellow variety of that. Then we have the SU shrunken, super sweet varieties. Uh, those actually hold their sweetness a little longer, and they're a little more firmer in their kernels. Uh, they're a little more challenging to grow, are a little shorter, but the shrunken SH2s are much sweeter than, the, than certainly the SUs and a little sweeter than the SEs. Uh, how sweet it is is a good, is a good shrunken variety that's all American selection win. And then we got our synergistics, and they are bred with a combination of the SEs and SH2s. So they have got a combination in their they're uh, kind of considered the super sweets. And a couple varieties that uh, have been shown in Tennessee by our, our UT Extension Vegetable Specialist uh, does a, allows growers all across the state of Tennessee to actually participate in a demonstration every year. 
and where they are given certain amounts of seeds of different varieties of vegetables and they, they plant them in their garden if they agree to keep, keep up with what they they get in terms of produce and they fill out surveys and sweetness and temptress which are designated there by synergistics uh, this past year were found to be very very favorable with all the producers and vegetable growers across the state of Tennessee that tried different varieties, those were the two that came to the top. So if you want to try a good, super sweet synergistic, you know, this year, think about sweetness or maybe temptress. Um, I think we kind of covered this particular slide already, but this kind of explains the different types of corn from the SU, the SEs, the SH2s, and the synergistics. So. Okay, number uh, number four is summer squash. Uh, very, very commonly grown. Uh, it can be put out by seed or transplants. It's a warm season crop, so it needs to be after frost. Uh, summer squashes, most of them are a bush type varieties and not, not nearly as related to winter squashes as our pumpkins are. So they're, they're quite different than winter squashes. Uh, We've got zucchini varieties, and this Easy Pick Green was one of those varieties that, that our gardeners across the state really liked in 2019. Uh, you've got crook neck yellow top squash, you've got yellow straight neck, and this uh, Tempest and Zephyr are two really good straight necks that those groups liked uh, throughout the state of Tennessee. Then the, the Patty Pans, the Sunburst was one that was noted as a really good Patty Pan variety of summer squash. A um, couple of things to watch out on summer squash or any cucurbit is uh, uh, squash bugs. They when they get on a squash, they're, they're kind of kind of like a stink bug that's a little bit more narrow, but they're gray. They lay eggs on the leaves. You'll see clusters of little yellowish orange uh, eggs on sometimes the bottom of the leaves, sometimes the top. When they hatch out, they'll come out little white nymphs. Uh, and then they, they eat a lot of the leaves. They'll, they'll actually eat on the fruit, but they're, they're more prone to transmit diseases. So watch out for squash bugs and watch out, watch out for the squash vine boards, which are, are kind of look like a parasitic wasp. So they're kind of red looking. They'll land on the leaf and kind of just sit there. When you see those out, you know they probably need to get a spray because what they do, those squash vine boards, they will land at the base of your squash, your pumpkin, most empty curb it, and they'll lay an egg at the, at the stump. And when that egg hatches out, it will get into that stump and it will eat that, that vine from the inside out. And what you'll see is when you go out on a pumpkin or a squash plant today, it might look just a little bit wilted, even though there's been plenty of moisture. Uh, you can go back the next day and it's wilted down a little bit more Many times by day four or five, the whole plant is totally wilted down and dies. So watch out for the squash vine borer. They usually come out. Sometimes it's in late, late uh, June. But be, be aware that they can devastate your crop of squash or pumpkins pretty fast. And then finally, tomatoes, probably the most common, common vegetable that we have. Uh, tomatoes are planted in our garden directly as transplants. They're very, they're not taller in the frost whatsoever. So if you didn't get them covered up last week, I'm sure you probably lost them. Uh, they are classified by their growth habit. You have the indeterminate types is more of the, the kinds that we grow in gardens and this is, is uh, vegetable gardeners that need steak, they keep growing. Most of our commercial growers will grow the, the determinant types, the more bushy types, where they flush and grow all at once and they harvest them all at once. But uh, tomatoes, uh, if you're growing varieties like the bee steaks, the better boys, those are indeterminate types. They need some type of support, whether you're, you're staking them, you're growing them in a cage. My preference is I will put up a cattle panel, raise it up off the ground to where it's at least six feet high, and then I'll plant on alternating sides of that cattle panel about every four, about every uh, 24 to 30 inches. As that tomato grows on the side of that, I will I will tie it to that panel as support. 
uh, and that works pretty well. And those those cattle panels store a little bit easier than, than the concrete reinforced cable. So, but if it's a if it's an indeterminate variety, you're probably going to need to support it in some form or fashion. And then our last slide is uh, just a kind of a little uh, quiz on on some of the common things we see in tomatoes. I think later on, the garden's going to do a, a diseases in the garden program here at the end of the month that will get more in depth on specific diseases that you're going to be looking for in your garden. But here's just a quick test on on vegetables in particular. Now the 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 fruit that we see right at the top in the very middle, in that particular condition is not a disease. That's actually a nutrient issue. That's what we call blossom end rot. And it always show up on the blossom end of the fruit. And that just indicates that, that while that fruit was, was maturing, that it growing, that that plant did not get enough calcium, which could then cause there's not enough calcium in the soil. Could have meant be because the plant's growing so fast, it's not taking up enough calcium. But uh, that, that's basically a calcium deficiency. You can see it on peppers. You can see it on watermelons. Uh, so many times, uh, if you get re regular moisture and the plant grows evenly, a lot of times if you see that on a few, that might go away. Certainly you can apply uh, calcium to help with that, but that's blossom in The photo on the left top, that is a disease, and that's what we call early blights. The leaves will show, and they'll start at the bottom of the plant, almost always, the leaves will, will yellow, brown, and they'll fire up from the bottom. And that is a fungal disease. So typically we'll start with the soil, the rain splatter up on the tops of the leaves, rotating helps with that. Uh, but a fungicide spray would help with this, like a chlorothalamil, uh, would be a good preventer that you might want to put on early blight. Now, if we go on the opposite side of the blossom end rot picture to the other leaf on the right hand side, that is also a disease, but this is a bacterial disease called bacterial spot. It is seen where you have a brown spot with a yellow halo around the leaf. It is not a fungus. It is actually a bacteria, so if you treated it with a fungicide, it would not do any good to treat that. You need to treat that with something specifically designed for bacteria, like copper or sulfur or something like that. Then if we go in the middle of the picture, right beneath the blossom end rot, to the picture of the leaves that's showing purple margins, that is actually another uh, mineral issue as phosphorus deficiency. So when we're seeing those purpling margins, that just tells you that your soil doesn't have enough phosphorus. You need to add phosphorus to that particular plant or that particular area. Then we go down to the bottom left corner, and we see fruit that have that, what we call cat facing, uh, whereas it's, it's kind of cracked and it's unleavenly grown. That actually is an environmental condition is probably due to irregular watering. You may have had too much water and the fruit actually grew out of its skin and started cracking. So many times that's not a disease, that's not an insect issue, that's just a matter of inadequate and infrequent or too much water at one time. The middle, bottom, uh, is a insect that we commonly see in tomatoes during the growing season and that is distinguished by a very large worm with a horn on the, on the back end, and that's a tomato hornworm. And most of the time what you'll see with this is not the worm itself because it's almost, it's almost uh, colored up exactly like the leaves, but you'll see little droppings below the, the tomato plant itself. And that will tell you to look real close and try to find that hornworm, and you can pinch those off if they don't get too many of them. If you get too many of them, they can be treated pretty effectively with an insecticide. And then the last thing is uh, this particular tomato in the right bottom corner uh, shows you some injury heel where that tomato probably has had an insect bite, maybe a, a stink bug. 
uh, where it's tried to heal over. This could have been caused by some cold weather that, that uh, caused that particular condition on the bottom of that, that fruit. Uh, could be a herbicide injury. Could be you had some drift if you sprayed your lawn to kill the dandelions or whatever might be going later in the season in the summer. And it drifted and could have had some herbicide injury. But more than likely, this to me looks like where it's been bitten by a stink bug and it's tried to heal over. So um, those are just some common things that we see. And I've gone on now for about 50 minutes, so I'll stop it right there. And uh, we'll see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, I mean, you don't have any in the chat box, but we encourage anybody to unmute themselves and ask a question right now. If they want to. I have a question here for you, Calvin. April Ray says, I'm having an extremely difficult time growing broccoli. Do you have any particular secrets? Well, broccoli, again, is, is a crop that can be grown in the spring or fall. Actually, in my experience, I have better luck uh, with, with growing it in the fall. Although I've got nine plants right now that are, I told my wife last night, maybe in a couple of weeks we'll, we maybe can start harvesting broccoli. But it seems to me like the fall is a little bit easier to grow. I start off with a good, healthy transplant. And the biggest issue I see with broccoli is those cabbage loopers. So keep an eye on them. When you see those white, white moths uh, flying around, you know, try to get a maybe dipel or some insecticide that you can put out there too. My wife loves broccoli, but if we ever boil broccoli one time and there's a worm that's floating up to the top, you know, she doesn't have a very high tolerance. She's done with it. I'll spoon the thing off and go ahead and eat. Uh, but, uh, you might try it in the fall. If you never try it in the fall, it seems to be a little easier for me to grow in the fall. All right, Kevin, got another question here from Denise. She wants to know, how do you keep critters, rabbits, raccoons, deer, et cetera, out of your crops? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. You know, if you're planting in an area that uh, has those critters in nearby areas, it's, it's hard. You know, sweet corn, raccoons, deer love sweet corn. But rabbits, I have I had trouble with rabbits in my cool season crops before. They like they like the cabbage and the, cab the broccoli and stuff. And, and the only foolproof way I know is, is, is to fence them out. Um, you know, that, that's, that's hard to do. Electric fence, you know, we, we put up a demonstration before in soybean fields where we put the ribbon, ribbon top electric fence up and we coat it every so often with some peanut butter to hopefully the deer will stick their nose to it and get shot. Um, you know, you can try scare, scarecrow type things, but if you put up a scarecrow, you've got to move it pretty regularly because if they see it in the same spot a couple of days in a row, they figure it out pretty fast. You know, there, there's a lot of tricks out there. I don't have any foolproof trick other than fencing them out, which is very, very difficult to do. It can be done e more easily and more expensively with an electric fence. But, uh, you know, if, you, if you're got deer, raccoons close by, they know when your corn gets ready probably Probably uh, sooner than you know it gets ready. When they find it, they'll come back to like completely devastate. What a rac raccoon will do, they'll knock, and deer too, they'll knock the whole stalk. So they'll, what even they don't eat, they knock down and they tear up. So that's a hard one. I don't have a good, a good easy answer other than fencing out if you possibly can and trying some of the other tactics, scare tactics, whether it be scarecrow or people that put human hair. Sometimes it'll work for a while, but it doesn't work very long for deer. So it's just one of those things you just got to keep working with. Just as a follow-up to that, Calvin, um, I've also had um, clients over this way that have used um, motion sensor lights, you know, put them around, around the garden and as something walks into the garden, you know, that light comes on. Uh, that may work for a short time, but if, uh, also, if it ends up being an excessive deal, that may be a, a point in time you might want to reach out to your TWRA person in the area. Uh, we've had, in, in times past, we've had to trap raccoons out of sweet corn patches. And if you're planning on doing something, 
that excessive, you definitely want that TWRA person on your side on that that situation. Yep. Good point. All right, Kevin. I don't see any more questions. The poll's been sent out, so if you got a chance to do the poll, we would appreciate it. And, um, is there anything else, Kevin? No, I appreciate everybody uh, joining today. And uh, going to be some more pretty good programs throughout the month. So if you have an interest, let us know. Be sure to join us. Uh, next week is um, we have a living mulch presentation on Tuesday. There is a presentation on sheep and goats on Thursday and the following week will be uh, either a backyard wildlife or woody ornamental talk on the following Tuesday and then on the following Thursday will be another garden type disease talk. So we still got four excellent presentations in the future. Hope y'all will join us.